uh, thank you very much for that introduction and thank you for inviting me to, uh, to come and speak uh, today. Um, I'm going to be asking tricky questions uh, without necessarily providing m many answers and I hope that it provides some uh, food for thought for how the, the, the Ocean uh, Data Centre might, um, uh, the, the kind of difficult deposits that might be uh, landing upon uh, the doorstep. Um, so I'll just say a little bit before I begin uh, about the DCC. We are um, the UK Centre of Expertise, uh, National Centre of Expertise in Digital Preservation and uh, Data Management, and we've been around for, for more than 10 years. We were founded in, in 2004. And the kind of work that we do is to provide guidance and tools and all sorts of other services on, on various aspects of research data management. We, we emerged actually from the kind of, from the e-journals uh, community, and as data became increasingly uh, spoken about in scholarly communications circles and indeed began, began to be valued as an equal um, output of research, uh, we adjusted our, um, our provision in order to uh, support that. So we organize a number of events. We organize national and international events, uh, both in person and uh, virtually via uh, webinars, including uh, our um, annual international digital curation conference, the next of which is in Amsterdam in February and a, a biannual research data management forum which uh, is organized on um, different topics, one of which was actually arts and humanities research and I'll provide a, a link, uh, sorry, arts and humanities research data and I'll provide a link to that uh, later. Uh, we, we have uh, principally worked in, in the UK but we are beginning to, um, uh, as uh, initiatives like the Research Data Alliance gather uh, momentum, we're beginning to work on a more international basis. We've always been part of European projects, but we increasingly work even further afield than, than Europe in, uh, with uh, colleagues in North America, in Australasia, uh, and indeed in, in South Africa. And we're, 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 we find that um, as data becomes a mainstream thing, the, um, the bodies and the, the organizations which are interested in it um, extend beyond the, the ivory towers of academia and into, uh, for example, into government and indeed uh, the commercial sector. The commercial sector are often very interested in archiving uh, of, of digital materials for not just for commercial gain but for compliance with uh, regulatory bodies, etc. So we're involved in, in, in three, I think, European projects at the moment. Foster, which is the one that I work on, which is about um, uh, inculcating good open science practice, especially among young uh, researchers, uh, Open Air uh, and UDAT, which is an infrastructure uh, uh, um, project. We also offer tailored consultancy and uh, training services, uh, as, as Peter mentioned, as do Dan's. Uh, we're, we're kind of a, a, a UK equivalent of Dan's, although we don't actually uh, manage any data ourselves, we would rather we go to other universities and explain to them how uh, they should do it. So um, what I'm going to talk about uh, over the next half hour or so is, is, is three things. One, to um, f kind of deconstruct, if you will, uh, although that's an abuse of the word deconstruct that would have uh, Derrida turning. Um, what do we mean by uh, research data management? Why is it different or what's difficult about it in the arts and humanities? And what can we do in order to uh, improve the situation? So I, I spend a lot of time at universities and I, have, I always tailor my message uh, for the audience uh, that, I'm, that I'm speaking to. Uh, but not everyone uh, in the research data management community is as thoughtful as I am. Um, so uh, here's a definition of, of what research data management uh, constitutes. Uh, and and it, it's a good one apart from, uh, what, apart from one issue which I'll, I'll, I'll draw your attention to in a minute. It's uh, the act of management and appraisal of data over the life cycle of scholarly and scientific interest. And the, the mandala-like um, psychedelic diagram on the left-hand side there is the DCC's um, curation life cycle model, which, um, w w which uh, emphasizes the kind of cyclical, iterative nature of research data management. Somebody creates something, it's used, it's uh, archived, and then it's reused, it's built upon effectively. And lots of people down the years have, have, have shared this kind of cyclical view of history. W.B. Yeats uh, is a very uh, kind of high profile example. So the active management and appraisal of data over the life cycle of scholarly and scientific interest. There are a few key words there. What well, one is life cycle, which suggests that um, the, 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 it's the life cycle of the scholarly interest, not the life cycle of the scholar, as in the relevance of data 
uh, may li live for considerably longer than the person who created it. That suggests that, in fact, that demands that um, a, a passing over of custody from uh, the, the collector of the information to somebody better suited to look after it for the longer term, i.e. a data centre, an archive, a library, somebody like that. Um, it mentions scientific interest, which, is, uh, w w which in common with a lot of materials on research data management uh, is, uh, is uh, a, a, an effect of thoughtlessness, I think, in that they don't really mean scientific, they mean scholar, uh, scholarly research interest, but for too many people there's tunnel vision and that's, uh, that scientific and research mean the same thing, and it was very heartening to hear Jan um, mention the example of Wissenschaft, whereby there is no separation between um, but between the arts um, and and the sciences in terms of in terms of research they're, they're both the same and in fact I often say that before the term science was coined in English it was known as natural philosophy so really what, when you talk about scholarly and scientific interest they really mean scholarly and philosophical interest although I, I don't al always get 100% uptake on that particular idea but the important word here isn't scientific it's active uh, research data management isn't something that happens on its own, at least not yet. It's something that requires active intervention from a number of different stakeholder types, from the researchers themselves to the, um, the longer-term data stewards, people who provide uh, IT infrastructure, all sorts of different people, all have to come together uh, to work towards a common goal, a common shared purpose. And that's something which in, in universities doesn't always happen automatically. It very much depends on the, the, the makeup of the university, indeed the makeup of the country, if, if you're talking about a national data centre or data service. So um, the old way of doing research, before we had widely networked distributed computing environments um, and indeed electronic publishing was as, uh, as follows, and this is very much painting in broad strokes. Uh, there, a researcher or a research group would collect inf information, or which often would be known as data. Uh, that data would be interpreted, it could be synthesized, it could be processed in some way according to algorithms. The researcher would write a paper based upon that data, and the paper would be published, and via the process of publication it would be preserved. So what you have then is the, pe the, the, the tip of the iceberg, as in the output of the research project is preserved, but the evidence, i.e. the data which underpins that uh, scholarly <coughs> output, is left to what, we, what the, the archival community would call benign neglect. Nobody actively wishes it uh, ill, but one day you go to find that data and it's no longer accessible. Uh, via one reason or another. Now, with networked computing, this is no longer necessary. This, was, uh, this, uh, this um, pattern was the case out of necessity in that there was no way to, um, to, to publish and to share and to uh, transfer data on, on the scale that it's possible to do today with uh, networked computing. But the, until quite recently, or relatively recently, the paradigm has stayed the same in that it's been possible to share data, to make it available, to enable people to try to reproduce research results. It just hasn't been done because of what we would call benign neglect. So the, the new way of doing uh, research, and this is uh, Data One's um, life cycle model. Data One is, is the Data um, Observatory Network for Earth, uh, an Earth and Climate Science uh, network uh, in the United States, funded by the National uh, Science Foundation, suggests that this is again a cyclical, iterative um, flow from uh, planning uh, related work um, to collecting data, at quality assuring it, and that's a form of processing, uh, to describing, preserving the data by depositing it uh, in a dedicated uh, data center, enabling others to discover it and then to integrate it with their work, to analyze it, to plan new research, and so on, uh, the, the, the uh, situation continues. Um, and a lot of people would say that the primary impetus for research data management is reuse, or at least the possibility of reuse, uh, allowing people to find and uh, find data and determine whether the conclusions which you as a researcher uh, have drawn from them whether they agree with them effectively, or whether they might find something else that they can do with this data that wasn't the same as your research question, but nonetheless, uh, you get more um, value for money from it. Now, there are other models which are available, and this is my favorite, and it's probably my favorite because it's hand-drawn. 
Uh, you won't be able to read this, but it's a, a diagram from somebody called Ellen Montgomery at the US Geological Survey, and she's got three uh, loops here which, which, which intersect at various points, and she suggests that the first loop round um, is, uh, to, is collection, processing, and documentation of data, and then the next loop is cataloging, archiving, publishing, and sharing, and then the third loop round is uh, curating, transforming, preserving, and serving and so on it goes, that the, the, the data it goes through these, the, these various loops before it reaches some form of um, stability. Um, so what, what Montgomery tried to capture here was uh, that we're dealing with a non-linear process and perhaps multi-threaded process. Uh, they overlap uh, as needed, um, parts of the process are always ongoing, uh, and that there's a transition between a data provider and a data curator, and sometimes we use the word steward to describe somebody who looks after a resource such as a data set for the longer term. So wh what the point of this kind of very short history lesson is that what's normal practice is shifting, and it's always shifting in, in academia. And the, the RCUK, which is the umbrella group of UK research councils, uh, suggests in its, its code of conduct that data management is a part of good research practice. It's basically something that researchers should do as part of their day-to-day -day, um, um, their day to day work because it's a good thing. You know, it's worth doing and it's self evident that if you're dealing with public funds that you should be um, that you should be managing them responsibly. Um, somebody who takes a more militant uh, view of this is uh, Nicole Yance, who, who wrote on an, on an LSE blog, uh, who, who asked the rhetorical question, is withholding your data simply bad science? Okay, so that's the basic l level, that, it, that at the very best it's bad science, or should it fall under scientific uh, misconduct? Um, as in, there's no reason not to do this. If you're not doing it, there's presumably a reason for it. Now, that reason could be that you don't want to do it because you can't be bothered, or it could be that you're trying to hide something. But either way, it's, it's not uh, best practice. Um, various um, uh, policy uh, drivers in, in, in the UK, in Europe, in the United States, in Holland, we heard earlier, are seeing this as being more and more part of the norm, that, that to manage data responsibly and to share it is increasingly just part of what good research practice means in the 21st century. Now, it, it, it's, okay to, um, it's okay for policymakers to insist upon this stuff, but if they don't provide the infrastructure, the training, the guidance, all that kind of stuff which is necessary, then you reach, a, a, and indeed the funding, uh, you, you have a situation where you have an unfunded, unsupported mandate, and those are not the most successful kinds uh, of mandate. So, so, so the, 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 the environment, the ecosystem is always um, uh, shifting and it's useful to remind ourselves um, what the, um, the, the, the benefits effectively of research data management are. Um, so first up, there's uh, the transparency argument and this is particularly pertinent when you're dealing with um, data which is publicly funded. Uh, and it suggests, uh, that this, this driver suggests, that the evidence which underpins research can be made open for anyone to scrutinize and in disciplines where this is possible to attempt to replicate their findings to see whether they agree with uh, what's been done. Now in order for that you don't just need the data but you also need a description of the methodology in order to reach or attempt to reach the same conclusions. Um, there's the efficiency argument which says that data can be collected once and it can be used many times for a variety of purposes. Um, there's the speed argument which says that data can be accessed much more quickly when it's deposited um, in a timely manner somewhere where it's eminently discoverable. And in some disciplines like climate science, for example, this is absolutely vital. And, and for example, um, Nelson says, um, if we wait five years to share climate related data about the Arctic, the Arctic is going to look very, very different. And he wrote, wrote that six years ago and we found that the Arctic uh, by and large does look quite different from uh, how it did in 2009. There's the risk management uh, angle, which suggests that a proactive approach to data management will reduce risk. It will reduce the risk of inappropriate disclosure of sensitive data. And sensitive data can be either commercially sensitive, it can have a financial value. And when you're dealing with research which involves commercial partners, then they'll be quite keen to ensure that data is... Um, is only released to the extent in which uh, they're, they're comfortable with. And there's also personal data. If you're doing research which relates to uh, living human subjects, then in most countries, 
uh, certainly in Europe, th those uh, subjects have rights and those rights need to be uh, respected. So you can't be um, careless with personal data which relates to uh, living humans because it is protected uh, by law. Uh, and finally, there's the preservation argument, which says that a lot of data is unique and it can only be captured once. If it's lost, it can't be replaced. And it's no uh, coincidence that the earliest data archives emerged from, for example, cl the climate science and the social science areas, where the, the, we're dealing with observational research, where you look at something and you capture the information and you have one chance to capture climatological data, you have one chance to capture a census. If you lose uh, that census, then it cannot be rerun. Uh, therefore, um, funders of research in these areas uh, tend to be less trusting of researchers to look after it for the longer term. They fund uh, and manage uh, their own data archives in order that uh, they can be assured that the data will be protected for the longer term. There's also a compliance issue, which is that uh, if somebody is giving you money to do something, they have a, a, a reasonable, uh, it's reasonable for them to say how they want things to be done, but that, um, that, that um, driver doesn't always play very well with researchers, um, so it's best to uh, avoid depending on the audience uh, that you're dealing with. What I'm going to do is, at the end of the, of the um, presentation, I'll return to this slide and ask uh, uh, and, and, and suggest a ranking of these drivers in terms of importance uh, in the arts uh, and humanities. So, I, I've spoken quite a lot about what data management is, but not necessarily what uh, data itself is, and this is a, a terminological uh, issue which can be a little bit thorny. Um, definitions will vary from discipline to discipline. Uh, this is a science-centric definition from, uh, the, from the United States, their Office of Management and Budget. Uh, and it says, the recorded factual material commonly accepted in the scientific community as necessary to validate research findings. Now, notwithstanding the fact that they, they, they say that data is always scientific, uh, the, 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 the two key words that I've emboldened here are the one that they suggest that it's factual uh, and the other that it's about validating research findings. And these are good, strong words and you know where you stand uh, with facts and validation. Uh, there's another definition which emerged from a project in the visual arts in the UK a couple of years ago. Um, which I'll talk a little bit more about. So, and, and they begin very strongly with evidence. Uh, um, data is evidence which is used or created to generate new knowledge and interpretations. And it was really good to see uh, Christine Borgman's um, um, de definition earlier, actually. That was one I hadn't seen, and I'll be looking up for, the, for these slides or their successor. Evidence may be intersubjective or subjective, physical or emotional, persistent or ephemeral, personal or public, explicit or tacit, and it may be consciously or unconsciously referenced by the researcher at some point during the course of their research. Now, if I were managing uh, a data center and somebody offered me a choice of which kind of data I would like to manage, I think I'd probably go with um, uh, factual um, uh, or, or, or certainly um, objective, physical, persistent, uh, public and explicit data as opposed to um, emotional, ephemeral, uh, unconsciously referenced data. Um, but but th this was a, a definition which was created by um, a, a project which was, which was entirely driven by uh, the, the visual arts. In fact, it was, um, it was run from the University of the Creative Arts uh, in, in the UK. The, the point is that definitions vary from discipline to discipline, and indeed audiences vary. And when you're talking about research data and research data management, it's essential, I think, to be mindful of the audience that you're um, addressing. Uh, otherwise, you can lose them within the first few seconds if you say, okay, let, let's talk about data science to a bunch of you know, choreographers. You're probably going to lose them at that point. So the, 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 there is a difference between the way in which research is carried out in the arts and humanities, especially in the creative arts. And I'm going to go quite far to this kind of uh, the, 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 the outer reaches of, of, of creative arts as opposed to uh, the digital humanities, which, are, which aren't a million miles away from uh, you, you know, um, the, the, the scientific method. But the scientific method um, uh, is uh, about um, observation, systematic observation, measurement, experiment, and the formulation, testing, and modification of hypotheses. Uh, arts methodologies um, will differ from science methodologies in that they're not about establishing objective truth. The, the, and, and indeed, if you're talking about practice-based research or conceptual art, 
uh, the the, the value of the work may be in the process and not in, in the output. And that's something that, that a lot of um, policy work, a lot of archiving work will struggle to deal with because it's not simple, it's not straightforward, it's hard to see where its beginning and end points are, it's hard to see what the outputs are, it's almost certainly not reproducible. Um, there's, there's very little point in reproducing a bit of conceptual art in many cases because it, the concept has been uh, exhausted. So the, the, these are the kinds of things that, that need to be borne in mind if you're looking to uh, support this kind uh, of work. I, I've now got a few tricky quotations and these are things that I, um, I, I sort of bear in mind when I'm talking to people and, and um, how um, fruitful they are, um, well, well, we can decide later. The, the French uh, uh, critic Paul Valéry uh, suggested that uh, an artwork is never completed except by some accident such as weariness, as in you grow tired of it and, and just say publish it. Satisfaction, which I think is a, is, is a strong, uh, <laughs> if you're satisfied with a piece of work then, then maybe you're finished with it but the world uh, probably isn't. Uh, the need to deliver as in a deadline or death. <laughs> so, um, for, in relation to who or what is making it, it can be only one stage in a series of inner transformations. And you begin to think of Ellen Montgomery's uh, loop model again. And, and Auden, the, the English poet W.H. Auden, um, famously paraphrased this, um, or um, certainly made it more succinct by suggesting that a work of art is never completed, it is only abandoned. Uh, and it may very well be that, that data sets are, are never completed. And indeed, the curation of data sets is never completed, uh, but, but only abandoned or at least neglected. Uh, Heraclitus, uh, the, 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 the Greek philosopher, um, is reported to have said that you could not step twice into the same river. Uh, the, the way in which we experience something at a given moment may not necessarily be the same as we experience it the following day, or indeed the following week, year, month, etc. And data sets are, in many cases, very dynamic, fluid resources. Can you step into the same data set twice? Um, in many cases, no, you can't step into Amazon the same way twice because Amazon is always changing, uh, et cetera, et cetera. And I wonder whether it's a coincidence that Amazon was named after a river. Uh, Edward Ng uh, suggests that in science, one man's noise is another man's signal uh, in that researchers will always be creating and capturing data sets for their own purposes, but they will not always be the, um, the ultimate reuser or the ultimate comprehender. Uh, of the data which uh, they produce. One, one of the objections which researchers often give to research data management and to data sharing and publication is, it's my data, nobody else can understand it. Uh, and the answer to that is you simply do not know what other people will make of the things that you're doing. Uh, and then we get into areas of epistemology that I'm absolutely not qualified to discuss, such as the, the relationship between data, information, uh, truth, etc. But just to note that the question of what is actually true and what is objectively true has been asked uh, for, for some considerable time. And we can say at least uh, 1,819 years or something like that. Um, but, but this is something which has been, uh, which has been played around with for, for, for quite some time. So we're not the first to start wondering about what we're actually dealing with here. That, that there are various strengths and weaknesses that the arts and humanities, and to a lesser extent, or, or perhaps a greater extent, the social sciences enjoy about research data management. And the first is that reuse of somebody else's data is entirely normal within the arts and humanities, and indeed within the social sciences. Social scientists uh, will deal, um, in many cases, principally with data which is created by, let's say, government via censuses, uh, by, by taking the surveys that other people have done and, um, and, and cross-comparing them and synthesizing them, etc. So it's entirely normal in a way that in many areas of the harder sciences, researchers have a reluctance to deal with stuff that wasn't developed at, or wasn't ca created or captured in their own lab. So it's something that's entirely comfortable. It's part of the culture and always has been. Uh, there are some examples here from Shakespeare's plots, none of which were original. Uh, Julia Kristeva, the, the, the French-Bulgarian uh, cu cultural theorist, talked about intertextuality, the relationship uh, of uh, texts and text in, uh, in French cultural theory doesn't just mean uh, things that are written down. Uh, and then on to visual arts, you've got the likes of Marcel Duchamp, who, um, who, who famously uh, provided um, or, or, or demonstrated or, or, um, um, or showed um, uh, ready-made objects and claimed uh, authorship over the way in which they were presented to T.S. Eliot, whose, whose work is a litany of 
uh, plagiarisms and quotations and misquotations, etc., uh, and all the way on to DJ culture, for example, that involves you know um, sampling records that have been made by others, and indeed um, playing two versions of a single record to make it last a, a great deal longer and to get d different dynamics out of it. Uh, the, the quotation I always come back to is one from E.M. Forster, which is "Only connect." And I, I, in many ways, I think that the point of the point and purpose of art is to connect in some way, and those connections are infinite and uh, and always changing. So that's the strength. I think that's the key strength about data in the arts and humanities. But it's more fraught than data reuse in other areas for a variety uh, of reasons and, and as I've suggested before the way in which arts and humanities data is handled is often going to need uh, a, di a different approach to that of the, of the harder sciences. In, uh, in the arts, um, especially in the creative arts, people won't always think of their sources, their influences or their outputs as being data. And the ways in which the, 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 their uh, uh, data, their outputs, are um, how much they, they, they value them and how they are uh, referenced, if indeed they ever are referenced, because there's the other quotation that talent borrows and genius steals, and as we all know, everyone in the creative arts is a genius. Uh, so the norms, what is expected, are, are, are quite different in the arts and humanities than they are in uh, the sciences. Um, furthermore, the data which emerges from arts processes is as likely to be an outcome uh, of the creative research process as I the input to our workflow. So it's not that kind of waterfall type diagram that I showed uh, earlier about the sciences. It, 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 if you look at the Arts and Humanities Research Council policy uh, on um, open access to outputs and to data, this is a, a, a U, the UK Arts and Humanities uh, Funder. There are references to data in there, but it's always about the data which is produced by research, not the data which is the input to, to the project, the, the process. And oftentimes when they talk about data, it, what they mean is digitized versions of maps or digital video of a performance or something like that. So it's not about the evidence, it's about the output. So it's the other end of, of the process. So. Um, the, 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 another complication is that practice-based research is very, very much the sole preserve of the arts and humanities, and the methods involved in these aren't always uh, linear, aren't always methodical, um, and uh, the, the process is very different to the way in which it's described in the bulk of literature, the bulk of literature which is, emerges from the STEM, science, uh, technology, engineering, and medicine, um, uh, communities. Um, furthermore, arts data uh, may in many cases be quite personal, i.e. sensitive, uh, and creative data in particular might not be factual in nature. We might be dealing with perceptions here rather than facts, and, and it's very difficult to say whether uh, these are, are, are worth sharing, can be shared, can be safely shared, etc. What, what matters principally in, in the arts and humanities isn't uh, the the, sub, the, the object of truth behind something, but the way in which it's expressed or arranged. And that, that, that variance in emphasis in the arts and humanities is, I think, why open access embargoes are longer and, and fairly uniformly longer in the arts and humanities than they are in the sciences, because it's about the quality of expression. It's not what you do, it's the way that you do it, that kind of thing. Um, Furthermore, creative uh, researchers may care a great deal about the way in which their work is presented. Um, it, we have I've spoken to a number of uh, creative researchers and done some case studies, and I'll give some references to them later. And the idea that they would use the standard university repository to show their work fills them with great, great dread and horror because they're not physicists. They don't want a list of publications with dates and things like that. That's not that's not how their work ought to be presented. Um, so there's a tension there between uh, being oblig obliging people across the board in a university or indeed in a country uh, or indeed in a network, a multi-country um, network, to use a single discovery uh, portal. Is it, that's not going to be popular with, uh, w with your visual artists, shall we say. But what do they have in common? Coming back to a strength, uh, both arts and science data sets may be financially valuable and they may be very, very precious. Where they're not financially valuable, they may still nonetheless be very precious to their creators. So we have to be sensitive, it, regardless of the audience, about how people feel about the data which they're producing and coming in hard and heavy with mandates uh, without first preparing the ground is unlikely to be a fruitful um, approach. 
Um, can somebody tell me when I've got about five minutes to go because um, I, I didn't start a timer? How am I doing for, for time? I'm, I'm okay. Well, j j when you want me to shut up, just wave or do something. It's fine. So, so I, 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 now to the, 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 the promised bit about tricky questions about data and the arts and humanities. And I'm not proposing to answer these questions. Uh, I, I hope that we can discuss them in the discussion session later. But if not, then they provide at least some food for thought. So the question, and the first one is kind of a rhetorical question. Are the goals, indeed, are the concepts of evidence fact, validation, replication, reproducibility, are these as important in disciplines which tend towards subjectivity, interpretation, argument, quality of expression? I would suggest not. How do we identify, preserve and share ephemera, emotions, the unconscious? How do we identify this and then archive it? How do we ensure that uh, it's not at odds with the intention of uh, the, the researcher? Is that important? Is, is the researcher's view of something um, something that we ought to privilege? How do we protect rights around creative data? And what are the financial, what are the IP issues around creative and arts research? Indeed, is it clear where creative and arts research begins and ends? Um, in many cases, in, uh, in um, small specialist institutions, such as art schools and conservatoires, most of the, the staff will be on, on partial contracts. They will be practicing artists half of the time and they will be teachers, tutors, lecturers the other half of the time. It's very unlikely in practice that they will have two separate sketchbooks, one for their funded research and one for their personal exploration. The likelihood is far more uh, that they, they will uh, be in the same place, and that some of it will be messy, that some of it will be personal, that some of it will, they won't want to share, some of it they will want to archive forever, um, regardless of who was funding the work at the time, because they think that it's important. Very difficult to draw lines there, so you have issu issues with uh, uh, boundaries. Now, I'm not suggesting that, um, that, that, that this is an either-or situation. It's very much a, a continuum. Uh, that, that there's certainly areas such as we've heard this morning in the, in the digital humanities, uh, which are very meth methodal, uh, methodical, that, that are uh, concerned with uh, facts or at least with empirical observation. Simply that it, this can be the case, and it's something that if you're uh, seeking to provide um, a, a service or, uh, or, or an archive around this that you shouldn't um, debar the way for people who want to take advantage of it. So um, what kind of complexities are introduced by practice or praxis-based research? Um, we, we, what, one of the, the quotes that we heard this morning, I think it was the Christine Borgman one, um, suggested that, that data was always digital or at least it was machine actionable. Um, I, I, I'm not sure about that, um, and indeed w some of the work we've done with uh, people in art schools and indeed people in mathematics departments uh, would suggest that it's not always machine actionable. There, well, there's a story um, of a, a mathematics researcher who cycles around every day with his life's work on paper in his backpack, uh, and he lives in one of the rainier parts of Britain. Um, so it, his, his, uh, his research is certainly not being uh, protected. It's certainly not uh, discoverable because it's in a backpack on paper. <laughs> it's, not, um, it's not being protected. It's not being curated, etc. And um, it's, it is subject to policy. And, and the, the, the researcher and the institution uh, are in breach of this policy. The researcher doesn't care because, you know, he's a researcher in, in, in mathematics and he's much more interested in equations. Um, anyway. So, so non-digital material is an issue, but oftentimes we hear people say things like my, my data is rocks, or my data is an ice core, uh, or my data is um, in a fridge. Uh, and I always say, no, it's not, because that, that is the thing. That is not the representation of the thing which data, data is. Uh, as um, I'm in the right place to be talking about Korzybski. Uh, the, the map is not, not the land. We're not talking about the original. We're talking about a representation of it, a measurement, a perception, etc. Um, what characteristics do arts and humanities data have in common with those of the sciences? Um, w w w the arts and humanities are always keen to um, emphasize their difference, but there is overlap there, and it's, it, it's certainly efficient for people seeking to provide a service to determine how much can be done the same and how much has to be done uh, differently for different audiences. And finally, is the perfect the enemy of the good? Uh, we, ca are we tying ourselves in knots with edge cases where we should simply be trying to do something that meets 90% of the requirements and then the other 10% will worry about that when it happens? Maybe, maybe not. 
So the, 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 there are some archiving issues around arts and humanities data, and this is a slide which I, I spoke about, a, a dedicated event for this in Nottingham about, about 18 months ago. Uh, and I always say that when you're preparing the business case for this, there are some questions which ought to be asked. And the first one is, could anyone die or go to jail if I, if I don't do this properly? And if the, the answer to that is no, then, then that's good. You can take a breath and you can worry about meeting policies and things like that. Um, so so it, to, to order these, whenever I'm, I'm helping universities to develop a business case about this, it's first of all, there's the law, okay? Uh, data protection suggests, that the data protection law says that if you uh, are careless with data which relates to living human subjects, then you're breaking the law. And the, not only the individual, but the institution in which this is happening um, could be subject to prosecution. Then after that, there's policy where nobody is going to go to jail or, or end up in court for breaking a research council's policies. They may, it may have financial implications though in that you might not be able to seek any more funding from them until it's done properly. Or in the case, some cases, in, the more, in cases of more militant funders, um, other people in your institution may be unable to seek funding from that funder until you get your, get your stuff in order. And then finally, there's the financial and cultural benefit of uh, archiving stuff which isn't mandated, doesn't need to be kept for a long time, but which we may nonetheless want to do because it has a cultural importance or because we think it might have financial value. And an example of that is at the University of the Arts London, one of their big kind of um, uh, prize collections is the Stanley Kubrick archive, Stanley Kubrick being uh, an American filmmaker who spent a lot of time uh, in England. Uh, and, and they manage this and pay for it and fund it out of their own budgets because they think it's a good thing for that university to do, to be associated with um, the, the legacy of that important filmmaker. Um, so so that, that's kind of the business case. That then when you get onto commercial considerations, uh, access and digitization, um, in most universities that I've experienced, the, the service providers are trying to get the researchers to be interested in their services. They're saying, come and deposit your material with us. In, in one university, the University of the Arts London, they have the opposite problem, which is that if they offer to archive everything that all of their researchers produce, then they will soon run out of money because all of their researchers want everything to be digitized uh, in very high resolution and kept forever, uh, regardless of whether it, that this uh, is mandated, needs to happen, or indeed is actually it's as valuable as the person who created it uh, thinks. So there's an issue there of selection and appraisal, and selection and appraisal are, are, are archival terms uh, about what you keep and, and how long you keep it for, and at what point you make a decision to get rid of something or at least hand it back to the people who gave it to you and say thank you for letting us hold this for a while, it's yours again. Um, furthermore, um, that there's an inverse relationship uh, between the um, the size of a of an institution. If we're talking about small specialist creative uh, institutions and the multiplicity of formats that their researchers uh, come out with, and that is a problem when you're archiving it. Um, most repositories will support a limited set of recommended file formats uh, and object types, uh, and it's very very difficult to uh, impose that on uh, creative researchers. And finally, there's the issue of uh, another archival term, which is respect the fonts, which is uh, for archival theory suggests that you should maintain holdings in the structure that they were deposited in. And, in, and when you're talking about um, creative works, you might not own all of the, the context, uh, but which nonetheless you need, want to at least uh, reflect, if not archive. Uh, so ownership and IP issues around creative work might make this incredibly uh, difficult. So a couple of discussion points, and this is again from the event in, in Nottingham. These are suggestions about how we might want to do, um, how we might want to approach it. First of all, what do we need to archive? Is it evidence without which the research outcomes are lost or they lose some form of meaning? Or do we want to archive materials for other reasons? Does preserving early work provide a richer experience, a richer understanding of creative work and processes? How do we make a business case for this? Because business cases, impact statements are the kind of game that we all have to play just now. Then there are issues of liminality. I mentioned before that many creative researchers are on fractional uh, contracts. There's not always a clear delineation between what they do because they want to do it and what they do because they're paid to do it. The likelihood is they do everything that they do because they want to do it. They just happen to be able to get some money out of somebody uh, for, for part of it. 
And then that question, is a work, is a creative work, is a data set ever finished or is it only abandoned? How do we know? The early versions of artworks are in many cases richer, more valuable, and a couple of examples there that are just from, from my personal uh, view. But how much time and effort does potentially sensitive creative data need in order to, for it to be prepared for archiving? And how do we know when it's worth it? How do we make uh, the, the, the case, case for this cultural or business? So I think this is the last uh, the, the last slide of any content. Um, I, I mentioned that um, th these were the, the 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 five key drivers for research data management, and I would like to suggest that these are the order in which we ought to tackle them in the arts and humanities. First of all, there's the risk management aspect, which is that a lot of data is personal, and uh, in 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 keeping with my, can anyone die or go to jail? That's risk management is 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 the first. Uh, thing that you need to um, to address. The second is about preservation because a great deal of arts and humanities, in fact, probably 99% of it, is unreproducible. It, it happens once, um, and uh, if it's lost, it can't be replaced. So there's certainly that uniqueness argument in the arts and humanities, which doesn't always exist in, in the physical sciences, but which does exist in, in uh, climate science, in social science, etc. Thirdly, there's the, the, the value for money argument, uh, which is that data collection can be funded once and used many times for a variety of purposes. Creative works are constantly being repurposed, reinvented, uh, reused, and um, in uh, contrast with a lot of uh, scientific uh, outputs, they are actually worth lots of money. Creative work can be monetized considerably easier than, than, than scientific work. In, in most cases, obviously, the, 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 there are um, uh, plenty of areas of science where you make lots of money out of it, but by and large, that's, that's not always the case. Uh, fourth, uh, it, I think, is the, and second least important, is the transparency argument, which says that evidence that underpins research can be made open to anyone to replicate the findings. I simply don't think that that's a very important thing in the arts and humanities. Um, and uh, it, it, it's certainly worth depositing things that the public purse has paid for, but the, there isn't that same impulse to ensure that um, so, for example, if you're running clinical trials and drug discovery, it's very, very important that you're able to reproduce findings. It's not ex is exactly the same when you're talking about choreography or a, or a musical concert or something like that that you uh, that you replicate, um, you know, uniformly each time. And finally, there's there's a speed uh, issue, which is that the Arctic is not going to uh, continue to melt any faster just because we don't share, um, you know, some some uh, sculpture data. So. Last slide, uh, or, or last um, substantive slide, what can we do? We can be careful with our terminology. We can be clear that when we talk about data, it's shorthand, it's not the dictionary definition, as in it's not always factual. Um, it's shorthand for a variety of scholarly products and byproducts, and um, a project which is being run at Manchester called researchobject.org, which is very interested in uh, methodologies, for example, in grey literature, in all the things which enable uh, a, a deeper and a richer understanding of, of a research project. And don't use the term science and research, if, you, if, if you're speaking in English, as I always am. Uh, don't use science and research uh, interchangeably and challenge those who do, and I always do, and people are sick of me for it, but I'm going to keep doing it. Uh, be mindful of the sometimes uh, blurred lines between professional investigation and personal expression, which is particularly um, common in, in, in art schools. It's important if you're offering a service to understand your customer, for want of a better word. So talk to researchers, understand their working methods, discover their needs and, uh, and manage their fears because they will be concerned about this. Uh, and, and one of the best bits of information, one of the best bits of advice I was ever given is build a bridge before it's needed. So go out and speak to them before you want them to do something so that they trust you already. Uh, and accept that not everything will need to be archived and uh, prioritized in some way. And the DCC has guidance, which is generic guidance, not necessarily about the arts and humanities, on, on what factors you might want to take into account when thinking about what to archive for the longer term. Uh, the, the, this slide is simply um, a, a bunch of links to some uh, work that we in the DCC have done uh, that's very specifically related to arts and humanities. We've uh, been part of a couple of uh, projects, we've uh, organised events and, and written case studies and blog posts and things like that. So these slides, will, uh, in fact these slides are already on SlideShare. Uh, so please take a look at them and follow them if you're interested. And if you're interested in hearing uh, or, or learning more about either the DCC or the Foster Project, which I kind of divide my time between at the moment, or indeed you want to get in touch with me to say I think you're talking rubbish, uh, then I, I'm very easy to get hold of. Um, so 
I can either take questions now or we can save them for the discussion. Up to you.